Bye. Okay. It's working. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I'm so sorry. At all. Not I've at literally all. never had, and I was thinking before, like, wow, I haven't really had any technical issues before. And now, like, everything has gone wrong today. But I'm so sorry. It's totally fine. Okay. Really. No problem. Um, okay. So I'm recording the audio yeah. only. Okay. So you don't, we can just like look at each other, but it's not being the, recorded. The sweaty knee pads in the background won't go on the, That's so right. those volleyball knee pads won't, won't be on the podcast. <laughs> Good. Um, so I'll like read your short bio and then I'll just ask you a bunch of questions. Sure. Sounds, Sounds great. I have them in front of me too. I got a chance to look them up. So yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'm thrilled today to be introducing Susan Faraday. Susan is a yoga and mindfulness teacher and describes herself in this order as author, yogi, and mom. A native of Greenwich Village in New York City, she now lives in East Hampton with her three children and their dog. So welcome, Susan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Um, so for listeners who aren't familiar with your many children's books, can you share what some of them are about? Sure. Um, they are, well, they, they, they sort of cover a whole range of topics, um, and, but they have kind of the same underlying messages. Um, so I, they range from books about exploring and celebrating art and art exploration to yoga to um, friendship and mindfulness um, and music. They kind of cover a whole, a whole range. Um, and, uh, but they all, I, I feel like they all sort of connect in that they're really about kids finding their voice and celebrating their own experience. And how, and how and why did you start writing children's books? When did that happen? I, well, so I've been writing forever. Um, I wrote a lot of poetry, um, as I was growing up and, um, I, but I was, uh, my parents always had me reading and had books everywhere. So books were a big part of my life. And then I was an elementary school teacher for many years um, and an avid collector of picture books. Um, and I, you know, that started way before I had kids. And then, of course, I had an excuse to have them when I had my children. <laughs> um, but really, they were for me. But um, so I, I guess, I, you know, I, I started writing picture books per se, um, once I had my kids, you know, I stopped, I had taken a step back from being in the classroom, um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to stay home with them, and as I was reading, and as I was observing, and as I was participating, I, there were just a lot of things that I felt could be covered, um, a lot of experiences that I wanted to capture, and I just was writing, and then ultimately I was lucky enough to, to be published, so... And how did that happen? I mean, I feel like everyone has a, a children's book or two in them, and yet nothing ever seems to happen. So, uh. oh, I was very fortunate um, in that I um, my my publishing journey began. I, I had this stack of stuff that I've written, um, and I have a very dear friend who is a picture book writer, um, Emma Walton Hamilton, and she. Uh, has a workshop or a conference every summer out in Southampton where I live. Um, and I approached her one day and I was like, what am I going to do with all this stuff, you know? <laughs> and she said, come take, come take my workshop. Maybe you'll be inspired. Maybe you'll learn something, whatever. So I, I went and took her particular workshop and um, it definitely inspired me. But it was the following year when Peter Reynolds was teaching at the conference. Um, and I was such a huge fan. And so I wanted to take his workshop. And in fact, she had, Emma had asked me to be his assistant because I've been there the year before. Um, I was the worst assistant ever. I'm you sure know. that's not you. <laughs> it's terrible. I, I showed up late. I left early. You know, I, 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 I don't think I got him a piece of paper, or, but he was the same, you know, he would show up late and hurry out. And I, so it was nice. It was, we were like kindred spirits, but one of the perks was being able to show him, um, my work. And um, as he was going through the stack, he came upon the museum, which was our first book together. And he literally said, well, this is a book, and I'll be very excited if someone else illustrates it. And I was like, what? And then um, we spent sort of the next six months 
creating a dummy. Um, he did sketches. I worked on the story and we met occasionally in the city, in New York City. And uh, we sent it out to his his agent. And then two weeks later, she sold it to Abrams. And that's kind of how it began. And, um, and Abrams then asked that we continue our partnership, which was funny because I already had a couple of things that I'd written that after that, that he also wanted to illustrate. So we kind of had this great sort of package to to share. Um, and then his agent signed me and, and I was with her for a while and then ultimately moved to another agency. And that's how it began. So um, it was really kind of that wonderful, you know, serendipitous experience. I read uh, the museum book to my kids last night. And I was like flipping the pages and showing them, and I was like, "This is Picasso, and you know, this is a photo, you know painting by Van Gogh." And they're like, "How do you know that?" <laughs> like, they're just You're so hard. They're really no. It's just I'm like they're really famous. Yes, yeah, they're real. Yeah. yeah, this is from a real museum. And then you know when you had the blank canvas, the kids are like, oh, "I bet they're gonna paint it in the book." And I was like, "Let's see." Anyway, they loved it. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, I mean, you know, I kind of turned to my um, experience with my own kids for that book and then but also remembering my experiences growing up in the city and and just having you know the good fortune to have all those museums and pieces of art in front of me and how nice it would have been to romp through the museum with no shoes on you know <laughs> dance with all the paintings and uh, yeah and I love this idea you you carry through your books of the blank canvas like the wall from you know the book that you have forthcoming about uh, how the whole community gets together and and paints the mural and you know brightens up the whole neighborhood and I love just with your books that people can bring their own sort of ideas to life is that was that intentional this theme of yours or I mean yes and yes and no I, I actually it was certainly for the museum and I guess also for Hay Wall um and now that you brought it to light, I, yeah, you know, the idea is that kids are so, um, they're so smart and they're the ones who are going to come up with ideas and, and, and ways to fix and change and conquer the world. Um, and so I think that kind of infuses its way into the books, you know, even with the water princess, although it was someone else's story, I, I, uh, I wanted it to be hopeful so that, when kids read it, they, you know, they can come up with solutions because they, they, they are um, at that point not as jaded as we are and certainly, you know, open to creativity and, and, and all of that and all they can offer. So, yeah, I think that it's kind of purposeful and accidental at the same time. <laughs> um, your books, I feel, also have this very soulful, calming element. It's like, I feel like, instead of me crazily reading to the kids at the end of the night when sometimes I'm just like trying to get through books, like, okay, three books, then they're going to go to bed. Yours, like, I read so slowly to them and they all kind of get into it. It's like your words, and I'll just read some that you have um, from I Am Yoga. But anyway, it really it really works. Whatever, so whatever secret sauce you're putting in your books, I don't know, it really impacts us as a family. But So in I Am Yoga, you wrote, when I feel small in a world so big, when I wonder how I fit in, when the world is spinning so fast, I tell my wiggling body, be still. I tell my thinking mind, be quiet. I tell my racing breath, be slow. I close my eyes and make room in my mind, in my heart, to create and imagine I am yoga. That's so beautiful. <laughs> like, it, like, it's just beautiful and it's therapeutic, and I feel like I need it, like the kids need it. How, how do you... I, I know you have training in mindfulness and yoga, teaching for children. How do you combine sort of what you've learned there to to put the words in the books to have just the right sort of tenor to, to be impactful? Oh, my gosh. Um, well, I'm totally honored by what you said. Um, I mean, I'm just, you know, I, I really, in my teaching um, and working with children, I, I try to observe how they feel and and how these practices make them feel. And also I think I'm a little bit stuck in my own kid and, and kind of what I, I wished I had had growing up, you know, that, that um, ability to make space and be calm. And um, so I, I, I just try to 
to put all of that into into the books, um, just uh, letting them know that they have the tools within them that are really accessible and simple. Um, and I just hope that it comes out the way you're saying it comes out. But it's really through kind of observation and and looking into my own self and, you know, knowing what I need, too. Um, so that that's sort of where I start. Oh. I'm going to read another passage from I Am Peace, um, just to further, you know, hammer home this, this peaceful writing style you have. Um, in I Am Peace, you write, there are times when I worry about what might happen next and what happened before. The thoughts in my head are like rushing water, and I feel like a boat with no anchor being carried away. I give myself a moment. I take a breath, and then I tell myself, it's all right. I feel the ground beneath my feet and steady myself and start to notice the here and the now. My thoughts begin to settle. My mind begins to clear. I am peace. Beautiful. <laughs> so I thought this one in particular um, was also a very mature concept. You know, do you find that kids of all ages relate to this? I mean, I think I read it to my two little guys last night, and and I think they just like the, the, the pace of it and everything. I'm not sure they totally got it, my three-year-old. I mean, who knows? Maybe he did. Um, what what do you think? Do you think it's more for older kids, younger kids? I think I think that there's some parts of it that all ages can get. So the the concrete images of like a, you know a boat with no anchor. Right. So right. most right. kids will understand that like an anchor holds a boat still, and if you're like a boat with no anchor, you're floating around, and that's all they need to grasp. You know they don't. It's not necessary that they get the entire thing, but if, if they're getting little bits and pieces of like, I can say a nice thing to myself, like, it's all right, I'm all right, or um, I can feel my feet on the ground. Like, those simple, concrete actions are what the littlest ones can relate to. And then as they get older, they, they do have this, I mean, when you talk to kids in schools, they say the most amazing things, you know, that you're like, wow, that is deep. Like, I didn't even think of that. Um, so sometimes, surprisingly, they, they grasp the bigger message. But even, again, just those little bits and pieces and concrete images or, or um, you know, little things that they can practice saying to, my, to themselves, that's enough. Mm -hmm. You know, that's enough of a start. So, um it, 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 I try to infuse the bigger message, the headier message, with the smaller accessible um, practices or activities or thoughts that, that I hope that the youngest ones can, can get a hold of. So when you go and teach mindfulness and yoga, I guess, but mindfulness in particular at schools and you know, do you do it, do you do people's homes? I'm not sure. Or just individuals or just schools or what? Mostly I, I do schools um, uh, or, you know, the library or whatever. Um, mostly I'm in the schools, I think. I've done classes in studios um, and I've done a couple of privates uh, and things like that. But I really like going into the schools and, and that seems to be the place where I'm most requested and most comfortable because it's kind of like exactly where they need it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There's so much going on in school, um, and whenever I do go and work with kids in schools, I always try to kind of infuse some small things that teachers can do because, you know, the idea of mindfulness can feel really big and difficult and time-consuming, and really it's not. Um, so I, I like I like being able to share it in, in that context so that the educators and the kids can see how simple these practices can be and how they can just use them wherever they are. I, I remember I was teaching in a school and one of the parents um, stopped me, you know, a few weeks into the, the class and uh, we ran into each other outside of school and she said, you know, I was in the grocery store with my daughter and we were running around and I, all of a sudden I turned around and she's standing in the frozen food section with her eyes closed and her hands on her belly and I was like, what are you doing? And she said, well, Susan told me if I was overwhelmed, I could stop and take a breath. Aww. And I was like, well, there you go. Like, that's the reason we do this. It's just so they feel a little empowered when things are overwhelming. So, yeah. So mostly it's 
schools. That was a long answer, but no, it's okay. good. That's the point. I would like to hear what you have to say. Um, so as a parent, right, I'm not a teacher or anything, but as a parent and for any parents, hopefully listening, what are some mindfulness tips? If you had like three strategies that we could have in our back pockets. Yeah. So parents, you know, it's, it's tough because so here I am, you know, teaching all these things and talking about all these things. And I have the same <laughs> challenges with my now three teens um, that anybody else has and moments when my kids will say, well, you're not being very mindful, you know, and I need that reminder. So I would say first and foremost, like forgive yourself for everything. You know, there, you're not doing anything wrong. If you lose it, if you uh, have trouble, if you need to step away, like that's, all of that is okay. And actually really good self-care, you know, I need a minute, like, give me a break. I'm going to go sit or whatever. Um, I think, so being able to do that, being able to kind of understand where you're coming from, what's rising up in you when there's conflict or stress. Um, oh goodness, that was terrible. Um, so all of those things, you know, that's first and foremost, I think, just realizing, like, if you're upset, where is that coming from? Is that your stuff or is that your kid's stuff? Um, and then being able to kind of give yourself what you need. So it's that whole putting your own oxygen mask on first. Um, and then breath, breathing. If you can get your kids to take three deep, slow breaths in through their noses during any time of crisis, that is a great tool. It instantly changes what's going on in your nervous system um, from that like fight or flight to that parasympathetic, like calming, grounding state. And there's research behind it. It's really simple and easy. Um, and then helping your kids sort of observe what is going on with them, you know? Um, and sometimes... Um, my kids, if they're having some kind of anxiety and they'll come to me and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking, what's wrong with me, or this is what's happening. And we'll say, I'll say, is that a, a fact or a feeling? Because if it's a feeling, it passes. And if it's a fact, then it's something concrete that we can deal with. I'm, scrib I'm scribbling this down. I have to use this later. Today. <laughs> <laughs> is that a fact or a feeling? I like it. All right. Yes. I really find that to be super helpful in a lot of situations because, you know, your your brain does tell you a lot of things that aren't really serving you and aren't really accurate. And as adults, it's good too. Like, wait a minute, is this really happening or is this just a feeling? So that that would be my my advice. Love it. Like many of the things you put in your books, I feel like. They could all be pillows. Do you know what I mean? Like I could like I could like <laughs> embroider all the sayings or something around there and scatter them around. You know, one in each room or something like that. <laughs> I do love it. Um, so tell me about Rock and Roll Soul. That's another one of the books. That's the first book of yours I actually bought because uh, we call my one of my daughters uh, rock star. So I was like, oh, perfect book for her. Um, it was it's a light. It's a it's a different sort of uh, you use a different voice. I feel like for that book. Um, so tell me a little bit about that one. Yeah, that book. Yeah, it, so that book is a little dancier and a little more energetic, I think. Um, you know, that book came, uh, well, it was kind of inspired by my editor, okay. Um, okay. who is, she edits a lot of music, but she loves music and she's very musical. And one day we were sitting and having a conversation and I think I said to her, like, wow, you're such a rock and roll soul. Like, you're so, you know, it's so cool. And, um, and that got me thinking, um, you know, I, I personally love music. Music is a huge part of my life and always has been. I don't play an instrument. Um, I sang, you know, in my high school chorus or whatever, but my, my, my parents always had music playing. Um, my mother had a record company for a while. There was always music. And then one of my first jobs, um, was, uh, working for Vibe magazine, so I was very infused in all of that kind of hip hop culture, and so music has just. And then my daughter is extraordinarily musical, so it's just been there. Um, and so I wanted to celebrate that. And um, so I, I think the voice, I hope, 
is more that kind of musical, dancey, you know, um, rock and rolly kind of of voice as opposed to the more lyrical, calming kind of. Yes. But I just wanted to kind of explore and appreciate all the genres and then go back to that idea of, you know, that blank canvas idea of like you can, you're the best instrument. You can kind of apply it however you feel good. You and know, everything has a sound. You, you should know? start selling, um, you know, those rolled up papers that come in a box, you know, you can like stretch them out and draw on them. Oh, yeah. You should, you should sell those like, you should brand it with your like I am yoga type imagery, you know, and like have people have the kids like fill it out and they can have their own canvases, you know? I think we're going to have to have a merch conversation. <laughs> Pillows and canvases. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, <sorry>. I'm ready. <laughs> sorry, I don't, know, I don't know why I'm saying it. Anyway. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then another book that I read of yours last night the other ones I had had for a long time, but some are more recent. Um, I think it's called Me and You or You and Me. What's it called? Yeah. You, you and me. me. Maybe I was really tired or something, but as I read it out loud, I was literally crying. It was so, like, it's all about, like, it's so close that you can miss paths with someone, right? I wasn't expecting it to be a book, kind of like a sliding doors, Gwyneth Paltrow theme. Wait, that's funny. But I, I, think, heard... I think about that all the time, like, it's so, it would be so easy to have not met my husband or not become really close friends with someone because we would have not been in that same class or what if I hadn't sat in that seat and that your book was all about just like an ode to chance and how huge a role it plays in our lives and uh, um, it's such a, such a nice book, you know, to give to anyone you have that like great relationship with but um, anyway, I felt like that I don't know. That one really, really got me last night <laughs> as well. And, no, I mean that. You know, I, I think I, I, um, I remember when my kids were really little, and I used to think about, and even now, when I look at them lovingly, as opposed to you know, like you're driving me crazy. Um, but I think, I think it started with them. I sort of thought, you know, what. Like if I had sneezed on that day or if I had taken a wrong step on that day or they might not be here. And then how, how sad, how unfortunate that I would have missed out on these incredible children who have come into my life, you know, or like you said, the friends I made or um, the way I met Peter Reynolds. I mean, if, if I had decided not to take that workshop, this whole trajectory would have been different. And that was actually the second the project that I already had in line to share with him, um, so our second book together. But I just, yeah, it's that sort of like, if just one little thing had been different, um, you know, that it could have been another great journey. But you think about the people in your lives now and how maybe you wouldn't have known them and how lucky we are to know them. So... I'm sorry you were crying, but I'm no. Kind of it was a happy cry. It was it was a happy cry because it's like happy, you know it's gratitude too for all the random yeah. events that have led to the way life is now. And, um, and it makes you wonder, like, are, are, is everything so random, or is it really like we were supposed to connect with each other? You know that kind of thing. Yeah, so just a little, uh, you know, meaning of life thoughts yeah. <laughs> at that time. You know. <laughs> um, so what are you going to do next? Are you going to keep doing the children's book, focus more on the teaching, aside from all the merchandise plans we've come up with? Uh -huh. <laughs> our, our, new, our new project. Um, I, you know, my intention is to keep writing. Um, I have some more things in the pipeline that are going to be coming out. Um, and so that's, that's great. And some of them will be a little bit different, and, and others are, will you know, kind of continue in the, in the messaging that's, that I'm doing now. Um, and I hope to keep it going for a long time. I'd love to explore uh, writing for a little bit older audience, mm -hmm. yep. whether that's, you know, teens or adults, or I'm, I'm kind of figuring that one out, but I have a lot of stuff I'd like to say and talk about. Um, and, um, yeah, and continue with the teaching for sure. Um, you know, I, I love doing that. It's, it's a way to keep me connected to kids. As mine get older, I get to still stay with younger ones, which is really lovely. I think it keeps me kind of youthful and connected to what's happening. 
Um, and I also get to teach teachers, which has been great. I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, professional development to teach teachers how to practice self-care and, you know, what is mindfulness really all about? Because these are big terms that people hear over and over and can seem sort of like, what does that really mean? And how can I possibly bring that to my own life? Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. And then I'm certainly open to whatever, is <laughs> right there, you know, um, never know. <laughs> And if there are any aspiring children's book authors or people who, um, you know, maybe just want to try getting on that path and publishing, what would you say to them? Any advice or should they get an illustrator right away? Should they do it on their own? One thing I learned um, is that, um, and so Peter and I were quite unique, A, in the way we met and B, in that. Uh, we we came together as sort of a little package because um, typically uh, editors and publishers do not want you, unless you are an author illustrator, mm -hmm. if you are the writer, they do not want you to bring in an illustrator. They really do want to take that process on themselves. Um, and in fact, once they do choose an illustrator, you don't, have any contact with them at all. I mean, I didn't speak to Matthew Cordell or John Parra, who did Hey Wall, until after the books were completed. Um, I, you know, I get to see sort of preliminary sketches, and I can give a little feedback to my editor, but there's no direct contact. There's wow. no, even Peter and I were instructed initially not to speak to one another during the process I and mean, that, you know, we kind of broke that rule, but, um, but no, typically you're just, so that's, that's one piece of advice is even though you have a vision when you're writing. And I mean, I always do as well. Um, don't, don't attach an illustrator to the work. And then the other thing is, you know, just keep writing and keep showing your work to as many people as you can uh, keep sharing it, keep putting it out there. Um, and, uh, you know, don't, don't give up. Um, I get a lot of rejections as much as I get, um, things accepted and bought. I also get things that just will never make it to the public eye. So just don't give up and just keep going and, and keep talking and sharing and, and doing the work. That's awesome. My uh, my daughter um, last night, um, or actually, I guess it was this morning. These days are so long. Um, we were watching the sunrise, and she goes, "Oh, for a second, I thought that was the sun still setting." And I said, "Well, that would be a great children's book. We could write a book about how the night the sun never set, and all the kids just stayed up all night and played. And how fun would that be, you know?" So, anyway, in case she decides to become a children's book author, there are there are ideas everywhere, and the cool thing is like noticing them and then writing them down. You never, you never know. But I think they're worth, I think they're worth at least putting down, you know, so, so you don't forget. Yeah. Good, good, good advice. Well, Susan, thank you. And thank you for dealing with all my technical difficulties awesome. today at the beginning of this call. Um, and uh, thank you. Just thanks for sharing all of your advice and your words and uh, making bedtime for my family really uh, a lot more peaceful. So. Oh. <laughs> So much. No, it was really wonderful talking. I think um, you know, I could have kept going forever. So <laughs> I'm really grateful. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I hope to see you for real in person, not just on video. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Susan. Take care. Okay. Bye.